Hey, everybody. Everybody's joining in here right now. It's nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Max. I'm from the Face First side, the head of games here. I, I work with uh, a lot of our video game development teams, including who we have today presenting with us. This is Simon Habib, who's going to be taking the floor in a minute here and kind of walking all of us through some really exciting areas that uh, I know we're all looking forward to seeing with their latest game. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on the facial animation pipeline for Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm Simon Habib a lead technical animator at IDOS Montreal. Uh, a bit about me, I started the first 10 years of my career as a rigging artist, which gave me a solid foundation for tool development, human anatomy, automation, and improving the user experience. In more recent years, I dedicated my time and attention to my true passion, which is facial animation. Uh, since action adventure narrative games are my favorite type of games to play, working on this project was a perfect match and allowed me to create genuine and emotional performances. Based on the incredible feedback that our game has received, I'm proud to say that our characters have resonated with players. To kick things off, I'd like to present you this 30 second clip from one of our cinematics, showing different stages of production throughout, uh, sorry, through different stages of production. Throughout this presentation, we'll see how this scene was created. You say you have all of this energy. Faith energy. Right, but when we first saw you, Weren't you stranded on Hallis Hope because your shuttle ran out of juice? Yes, I was, but... So why didn't you just believe that your ship had more gas? It doesn't work that way. Faith energy is a byproduct of belief. Focused belief. <laughs> okay, sure. I saw this proven. Here are the topics we'll be covering in this presentation. First, we'll start by talking about the vision our goals and expectations at the start of the project. Next, we'll talk about the photogrammetry scan. This is the process in which we take images of a model in order to get uh, more anatomically correct characters. In the third section, we'll explore the three types of performance capture that we used in our game. In the fourth section, we'll talk about how we processed all the data from these captured sessions and converted them into animations. In the fifth section, we'll talk about the cinematic polish and how we brought these animations to final quality. And finally, we'll end with a Q&A. So I'd invite you to write down your questions either in the notepad or in the webinar's dedicated Q&A section. And I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Uh, if we run out of time and you'd like to chat about any of this, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find all my social links at simonhabib.com. Uh, I want to mention that this is a facial animation centric talk, so I won't be covering everything about the cinematic pipeline or facial rigging. Uh, it's really about how we capture our actors and how we animate our characters. I may get into some technical concepts, but it's still meant to be an overview of the pipeline. So the vision, what did we set out to do when we started this project? We knew that Guardians of the Galaxy was going to be a performance driven narrative game. Since it's the Guardians, there would be an ensemble cast of five characters, and that they, we knew that they'd be together for most of the game. We knew that these characters were going to be stylized to look more like their comic book counterparts, but they had to be very believable. We wanted a lot of emotion to come through these characters. We also knew that they would be traveling to different planets, so there would be non-human characters as well. We wanted to push what is done in our industry. We wanted to look at different, different technical innovations that we could incorporate into our game. One of those is photogrammetry. Typically on games, we would have a team of character artists sculpting and using reference images to create their characters. Whereas with photogrammetry, we get the precision of scanning an actual person to be the basis of our characters. We'll talk a bit more about it in the next section. In terms of audio versus video-based animations, a lot of games use audio tracks to generate facial animations. And while that may give very accurate lip sync, it kind of has to approximate what to do with the rest of the face, which is usually procedurally generated using emotion tags. When working with video-based animations, an actor's, uh, an actor's performance is our source and is directly translated onto our characters. So we get more believable performances and nuance. Uh, at IDOS Montreal, we were fortunate to have our own in-house mocap stage, and we were planning to use it extensively for this project. Our cast was comprised primarily of local actors, which meant the turnaround from booking our sessions, capturing all our data, and then generating usable animations was very, very short, especially if we were to compare this uh, with working with an external mocap studio. Uh, let's talk about the advantages of full performance capture. 
Many game developers tend to record their voices separate from their body mocap and facial capture, then stitch it all together for their cinematics, which doesn't always guarantee that they'll all line up to give a cohesive performance. In contrast, when we're working with our actors, their voices, their faces, and their bodies are all recorded at the same time, which ensures that the performance is as accurate and as natural as possible. In video games, we often hear that we have to either choose quantity or quality, meaning we either have lots of animations or fewer at a much higher quality. On this project, we tried to prove that it'd be possible to offer both quantity and quality by having multiple tiers of quality of facial animation. Bronze being uh, mostly automated with little to no manual labor. Silver is the one that comes closest to the actual performance, but requires a manual polish pass. And then gold is really that fine, uh, is really for that final touch at the end, and it's reserved for the most important shots. The first topic we're going to look at is photogrammetry scanning. This is the process of taking hundreds of images of a subject from many different angles to build a 3D model. Given that our game is stylized, our characters didn't need to be one-to-one -one with the performers. So we had to make a decision. Do we want to start by casting a model and then designing a concept art based on that person or vice versa? In our game, we decided we were going to design the concept art first and then cast a model that best fits that character. This photogrammetry room was designed by Pixel Light Effects and assembled in our own studio. The room itself is composed of 40 DSLR cameras and 50 softbox lights, which would all get triggered at the same time. The lights ensure that we have a nice diffuse lighting with hardly any shadows across the face. In total, we had 13 scan sessions, so 13 different models that came in for different, uh, for different characters. When each model would come in, we would dot their faces with roughly 100 facial markers using an eyeliner, which allowed the character artist to accurately track the deformation of the face and the skin sliding. In this booth, we would ask the models to hold about 25 different facial expressions, and these full face expressions is what we use to separate into 138 blend shapes for our facial rigs. Let's quickly go over the workflow. So these cameras would give us a CR2 raw image file that we would pass into Lightroom Classic for some color balancing and light adjustments. Uh, bringing these edited pictures into reality capture gave us a point cloud and generated very high res meshes. With the CLI version, short for command line interface, we were able to automate this process, making it much quicker, especially considering the number of expressions that we captured for each model that would come in. Then we would hand off these high res meshes to the character artist team who would bring them into Wrap 3, apply them onto our base mesh, bring them into ZBrush for cleanup, stylization, and final polish. Over here, we have a preview in Maya of those blend shapes blending in from one to another. The goal for this first test was to try to get our digital character as close to a perfect match with our real life model before the stylization phase. The advantage of applying these blend shapes to a base mesh is that we can mix and match different parts of multiple characters with one another in order to create brand new characters. In the upper right corner, we can see a sample of different expressions taken from a single camera. And beneath it, we have an expression sheet of those expressions converted as blend shapes. Next, we'll talk about the performance capture. From our in-house motion capture set, our actors' body motion, facial performances, and voices are recorded simultaneously. There are three types of performance capture that we used on this project, and we'll explore each of them. In the bottom picture, we can see the mocap volume that we use for all of our cinematics um, and in-game dialogue. Even though it's a relatively small volume in comparison to other studios, it was great for conversations, some simple locomotion, and even some stunts. Uh, at most, we had seven actors recorded at the same time, of which six were wearing head-mounted cameras used for facial performance capture which was the maximum that we had available on set. The body mocap was recorded by OptiTrack and the helmet cams were provided by Facewear. In the picture on the right, we can see our cast all geared up in their suits uh, and helmet cameras. You may notice that each actor has their own lav microphone attached to the front of their helmets, which allowed us to record their audio tracks individually and then combine them all into a single file whenever needed. When capturing the body motion for all these actors with the facial footage, with the microphones, and with three reference cameras placed around the room, all this data had to be synced. So we would use a common time code across all of them. 
we also needed to trigger the recording of all these devices at the same time and to name all of our files consistently. So we had an in-house solution called Lumière. From the bottom image, we can see the monitors with the facial performance videos being streamed in uh, in real time. On a typical shoot, we would have about five people supervising this session from this angle. We had our producer, our cinematic director, our mocap specialist, our audio engineer, and myself, the facial tech. We also had a team who would help us to suit up the actors in the morning when they would come in. Uh, all of this was under normal conditions, but of course our last year of production was not under normal conditions. Uh, we had restrictive measures to follow and a strict protocol with social distancing, masks, visors, hand sanitizer, and all that. But what was the most interesting is that we had a camera recording the entire room that we could stream via Zoom so that certain people could actually monitor our shoots from home uh, and provide feedback through Slack. We had to make do with the situation and we pulled it off by, and managed to complete all the recordings that we had left to do. On this slide, we have a closer look at the helmet cams that we were using. This is the Mark III model of FaceRay's head-mounted camera, or HMC for short. Uh, even though they re recently released the Mark IV model, we were using the Mark III throughout our production. The cameras are uh, recorded in RGB, so color footage at 720p, 60 frames per second. Beneath the camera, there's a dimmable LED light, which helps to reduce harsh background lights and minimize shadows across the face. Uh, on the belt that the actors are wearing, there was, there's an on-off switch that allows them to turn off their lights between takes. The two images above show a single arm boom to support the camera. But for our recording sessions, we always use the double boom as shown below. It offered a lot more stability in the footage, which significantly increases the accuracy of the tracking. The HMCs are battery powered, which allows our performers to, to be untethered. Uh, the batteries themselves were usually swapped with full ones halfway through the day to prevent them cutting out during recording. The video feed is transmitted wirelessly to a TerraDeck receiver, which is connected to a Keypro recorder. On the monitors that we saw in the previous slide, we could, see, um, we could display a grid overlay to adjust the framing of each actor's helmet to make sure that their face was nicely centered in that vertical video. This was useful for ensuring consistency throughout the day and between shoots. We would also use, the, um, use that, that, that monitor to adjust the lens's focus to make sure our pixels were as sharp uh, as possible for the tracking process. Um, speaking of calibration, we would draw tiny dots across the performer's face, 27 to be exact, that match the same tracking landmarks in the software that we used to track the facial performances. Um, it's also really important to mention the comfort of the actors. Fortunately, these helmets are actually pretty lightweight compared to other models. While the camera and the light are placed in front of the actor's face, they're just low enough that it doesn't occlude their vision. So we always have to keep in mind that we don't want to hinder their performance. Over here, we'll see the performance capture footage for the same cinematic that we saw early at the beginning of the presentation. On the right, we have the six HMC videos. In the center, we have the three reference camera videos. And in the bottom, we have the take name and the time code, which allows us to sync all of our media files, including the individual audio tracks that are all combined to create a single audio file for this video. You say you have all of this energy. Faith energy. Right, but when we first saw you, weren't you stranded on Hallow's Hope because your shuttle ran out of juice? Yes, I was, but... So why didn't you just believe that your ship had more gas? It doesn't work that way. Faith energy is a byproduct of belief. Focused belief. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I saw this proven. Uh, these tiled videos are, are, are assembled by an automation script using FFmpeg commands and are crucial for our editing process. Our cinematic director would use these videos to identify the selected takes and stitch them to get together to create a first pass edit. Another type of performance capture is what we call banter sessions. We knew that our Guardians of the Galaxy were going to be talking throughout the entire game, so not just in cinematics, but also throughout gameplay. Typically, these types of recording sessions are done with a single actor in an audio booth, recording their lines one after another, without necessarily having any castmates to interact with.
For our game, we had the advantage of recording all of our actors together in one space, which allowed them to maintain their chemistry and ensured that their dialogue felt a lot more genuine and dynamic. In total, we recorded 23,000 lines of dialogue, and for every one of them, the actors were wearing an HMC. The videos of these performances were used to generate uh, the facial animations for our locomotion, combat, and in-game conversations. By referring to the timecode metadata embedded in our audio tracks, we could identify the start time and the duration of each audio clip so that we could clip the corresponding HMC videos. Uh, even though we were tracking the entire face, we were using primarily the lower part for the lip sync. The full face data was passed onto a machine learning process that would give us an emotion track, uh, which we'll talk a bit about uh, a bit later. Uh, in this next video, we have a clip from a banter session. In this example, the actors are standing still while they read their lines from a tablet. Typically, when, we, when recording with a stationary or suspended microphone, actors are, are usually required to direct their voice, which limits their movement. Since our microphones were attached to the helmets, the actors were free to move around as much as they wanted during the recording sessions without causing any gain issues or distortion in the audio. So let me find that video. This carnage brings back troubling memories of worlds I destroyed. Always wondered, what did you use to do that? Some kind of mega bombs? Rocket! Blades. My own hands. And feet. Knees. Elbows. Often my forehead. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> it starts it's terrifying. Body parts. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Uh, I chose this clip because it also shows a bit of the levity among our performers. Uh, between takes, they were often laughing and cracking jokes. Um, considering that these sessions that these sessions can be very long, uh, it was really nice to see that they were still enjoying the writing that was given to them and always maintaining that chemistry between each other. The third and last type of performance capture that we used is emotion capture. During these sessions, we would ask the actors to perform a range of different emotions at varying degrees of intensity. The emotions that we had narrowed down were content, angry, nervous, and sad. The theory behind this is that when we speak with different emotions, we have a lot of nonverbal gestures, both as a speaker and as a listener. With that in mind, we paired the actors one-on-one -on -one, and we had them both standing and seated, which offered a wide range of different body gestures that we could add as a layer on top of locomotion. As I mentioned earlier, the facial performance recorded during the banter sessions could be passed to a machine learning process to generate an emotion track and this would determine an actor's emotional state and intensity. The values would fetch the corresponding animation from our library and drive the upper portion of the face as well as the body gestures. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this, I recommend that you check out a GDC session called Emotion Detection for Expressive Characters in Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, given by Ramin Trachel. Uh, his talk was part of the Machine Learning Summit and is now available to watch in, the, in this year's GDC vault. In this next video, we have an example of in-game banters. You'll notice that the lip sync matches the performance and the body has overlaid animation. You'll also notice that there's an automated directional look at for the eyes, the head, and the torso. So depending on who is talking, they would look at each other. Keep in mind that this is auto-generated, so we consider it a bronze performance. It would be easier to throw the rodent. No, it would not. What if he breaks a leg? He would still have three. No one's throwing rocket. I am good. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just leave it. What's your problem? My problem is Meathead trying to huck me over a cliff. You are overreacting. I did not throw you. Only because Quill stopped you. And there should be no problem. I'm watching you, you Katafian psychopath. Imagine that they could be walking or running through the environment. Uh, and these animations would be layered on top of locomotion. But for the sake of this clip, the characters are standing still. Uh, I picked this clip to also demonstrate how our facial performance translates quite well onto a non-human character like Rocket. So after we've captured all this data from these three types of performance capture sessions, how do we convert it all into animations? So batch processing. It's the ability to run through thousands of videos, automatically track actors' facial performances, and apply first-pass animations to their respective character rates. 
To be able to batch the tracking of our performance videos and generate facial animations, we have to train the software to understand how each actor's face moves slightly different from one another. We often use the term profiles to describe the binding of our real life actor to their respective digital character. On the right, we see two screenshots of Faceware Analyzer, the facial tracking software that we used. As part of this training process, we build a tracking model, which is a collection of all the different expressions and mouth shapes that we have throughout our timeline. I wrote less is more in the sense that we want to identify the peak expressions, also known as training frames. We, we want to avoid too many redundancies and let the software do the interpolation between them. Consistency is key, meaning that if we introduce too many contradictions between similar expressions, the software doesn't really know how to deal with them, and that could result in shaky tracking. After we finished our tracking model, we repeat a similar process in Faceware Retargeter, which we used in Maya, to build out a pose library of corresponding facial expressions on our digital character. That library can contain a lot of extremes, but we also wanted to include a lot of subtle expressions to really have a nice range. We decided that we would keep a bit of asymmetry in order to get the timing from what the actors were doing. In total, we had facial profiles for 20 characters on our project. One way to efficiently build a facial profile is to create is to record a facial ROM, which is short for range of motion. In this video, I've chosen different parts of a typical ROM and edited down to about a minute. These videos usually take about five minutes to record. Um, we focus on different, on different face groups. We'll start by isolating the eyes, the brows, and the mouth. And then we end with a mix of different emotions and lines to test the range of our profiles. Eyes looking forward, wide forward, now wide up, down, left, right. One wide rotation, just the clockwise, the clockwise pass, yeah, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Skewed left, mm -hmm. skewed right. Mm -hmm. I. I. I, I e, 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 U, 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 U O, O, O. o. Uh, smile with closed lips. Mm -hmm. Extreme. Skewed left, like a smirk left. Mm -hmm. Smirk right. Great. Close sneer. Scrunch up the nose. Close. Nostril teeth. The human torch was denied a bank loan. The human torch was denied a bank loan! While the purpose of a facial ROM is mostly for building our character profiles, we found out that it had a lot of other benefits as well. It served as a really good vocal warm-up for the actors at the beginning of the day, uh, for adjusting audio levels, and for testing the recording trigger across our multiple devices, including the embedded timecode. For those reasons, we would do it for every session, even if we weren't using the footage necessarily to create new profiles. Um, some characters were actually able to benef benefit from the same one facial ROM that we had set up early in the project, and we never really had to create another. ROMs were still necessary whenever we had a new actor joining the cast so that we could create a profile for them and pair them to their digital character. These are the tools that we used for batching. On the left, we have the analyzer batch in which we would provide pre-edited videos, meaning that they were rotated, the time code was baked in, and we had converted them to MP4. The neutral frame is a neutral expression of our given actor to calculate a delta with all the different expressions. And the tracking model, as we mentioned earlier, is the collection of all the different expressions and training frames that were tracked. On the right, we have the interface for the retargeter batch that we ran in Maya. We would provide a character setup file that contains the list of all the animatable control, uh, facial, control, facial controllers, uh, as well as the shared poses which again is the collection of all the expressions that we applied onto the rig. Retarget, Retargeter offers parameters for smoothing and pruning, which are very useful, uh, but we also developed a few animation post-process solutions. For example, to improve the accuracy of the teeth contact, to steady the lookats during blinks to prevent dips, and to smooth the animation curves for specific controllers, especially those that drive asymmetry or large areas of the face. And then finally, we also had a PlayBlast function to generate videos of our facial animations that would include an image plane and the audio track. This meant that we didn't have to load each scene's Maya files uh, for animation reviews. After batching all this data and generating our bronze animations, we can move on to the cinematic polish. This is a technical and artistic polish pass on top of existing animations 
to obtain the highest fidelity and most believable animations. Over here, we have the team of motion artists. In our team of four, we were part of the cinematic department. One of our team's responsibilities was handling the body mocap data, which included suiting up the actors when they would come in, as well as setting up the actors' body profiles in Motion Builder. Then we would clean up the data and retarget it onto the, the res their respective characters' body rig. Regarding faces, our team was in charge of setting up the face for profiles based on the facial ROMs that would allow us to batch process all of our bronze animations for in-game dialogues and for our cinematics. We also took care of the, facial, uh, the silver facial pass, so I broke it down here into two steps. A technical pass, which our goal was to try to match the performance as closely to what the actors did. Accuracy and capturing subtlety were usually the priority in this phase. There's also the tongue animation. Since our video footage doesn't provide tongue tracking, this was manually keyframed for specific close-ups when needed. Uh, then there's also what we call the artistic pass, where we can actually go a little beyond what the performers did. So we can emphasize certain expressions. We can hold expressions for comedic timing, and it's also an opportunity to accentuate the asymmetry that the batch process gave us. In this video, we'll see a comparison between bronze and silver. So on screen left, we have a version that was automatically generated, meaning no manual polish. And on the right, we have a silver quality of facial animation, which had both a technical and an artistic pass. This was captured in Maya, not our game engine, which is why some of the shaders may appear a bit different. Oh! <laughs> Please proceed. Ah, you go ahead. No need, I insist. No, I insist. Please, proceed. This pointless pageant of politeness plagues our progress. Which is why you should go first. Very well. I will voyage through the vexing vestibule. <laughs> While it's kind of hard to split our eyes to watch both, um, we can feel that the bronze one works quite well for maybe a distant shot or a secondary character. But for cinematics, we really wanted to be faithful to the performance and capture all the nuance and subtlety. Uh, over here is another example uh, of what we did in the motion artist team. We generally work in a standalone scene with just a single character, with no body animations and no set. This meant that we had the maximum frame rate and no distractions. You may notice the colored sphere uh, in the bottom left corner. This was meant to help us to identify the frames in which we had close-ups, medium shots, or the character was off screen. This allowed us to focus the polish time really on the moments that mattered the most. Uh, in the image plane of the actors, we can see the burned-in tracking data. Uh, that was output from Analyzer. If we ever spotted issues in our animation, we could see whether it was coming from the original tracking data and we could go back and make adjustments or fix them directly in our keyframes. This is actually the facial animation scene from the same sequence that we saw at the very beginning, so the conversation between Starlord and Raker. Uh, for the sake of this slide, I assembled uh, two videos side by side. You say you have all of this energy. Faith energy. Right, but... When we first saw you, weren't you stranded on Hallow's Hope because your shuttle ran out of juice? Yes, I was, but... So why didn't you just believe that your ship had more gas? It doesn't work that way. Faith energy is a byproduct of belief. Focused belief. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> I saw this proven. After the motion artists have completed their work with the body mocap data, as well as the silver facial animation, we would hand this off to the cinematic animators. Part of their job was to assemble all the scenes and bring the animations to final quality. That includes the many different characters, props, vehicles, cinematic cameras, and environments. They would also animate the hands for all of our characters, since those weren't part of our performance capture process. Aside from humanoid characters, they would also animate animals and creatures. In the images here, we have the example of Cosmo the dog. While his voice was provided by an actor, we didn't capture an actual dog's face. Uh, we did, however, capture the body motion of two dogs for several of his scenes. Another task was the head and look at adjustments, since a lot of the actors don't have the same proportions as their characters. The best example is Rocket, where his actor was almost the same height as Star-Lord's, but the character of Rocket is much shorter. 
specific to characters' faces, our cinematic animators would bring some of our facial animations to a gold quality level for specific emotional story beats and for marketing shots. It was up to them to give it that final beauty pass. They also had the advantage of animating to the camera, as opposed to the motion artists team who worked in, a, in standalone scenes. Even though we had the color orbs to know the proximity of the camera, the cinematic animators were able to polish the faces directly in the scene with the body animations. So we're almost at the end of the presentation. I want to go over some takeaways from this production. I believe we delivered on our promise of shipping with quality and quantity. We had 13 scan sessions, so 13 models that came in as the basis of our characters, providing anatomically correct blend shapes. We created 20 unique facewear profiles that could be used for batch processing. For the in-game dialogue, including combat, conversations, and locomotion, we recorded 23,000 lines. Almost all of those shipped as bronze animations. I didn't put 100% uh, because there were a few that we had to manually adjust for corrections. Uh, so I can't say 100%, but very close. And then for cinematics, we had a bit over five hours of cinematic content, which includes the multiple branching paths in our story based on the player's choice. The ratio between silver and gold is about 90% silver and 10% for gold. Quickly looking to the future, how can we improve all of this? Um, I look forward to improving the overall quality of the animations that, were gener that we generate from our performance capture. For example, polishing them directly in the scene with the cinematic cameras. I also look forward to maybe higher realism, but this is usually dictated by the art direction of a project. It would be nice to see how far we can push the results of our photogrammetry scans and combine that with performance capture. And then finally, there's previewing our animations in engine with proper lighting and shaders to try to get a faster turnaround than just rendering from Maya. And to wrap up, I would like to present this 45 second clip of a gold sequence that incorporates almost everything that we saw in this presentation. So enjoy. Tomorrow, oh wait, hold on a sec. Why? So more children can be sacrificed in the name of Rager's flagged up church? No, of course not, just- Just what, Peter? If you had just let me finish this on the temple ship, we wouldn't be here. They wouldn't be here. I know Raker brings back bad memories. This isn't about Thanos. It's about Nikki and what men like Raker and Thanos do to girls like her. Like me, my sister. If I had just been better at protecting Nebula, maybe, maybe she wouldn't be dead. Whoa, what? Nebula's dead? How? By who? Tell me, so I can find him and shake his crack in hand. So it's kind of a heavy scene, but I'll leave you with that and move on to the Q&A portion. If you have any questions or thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Feel free to write them in the webinars Q&A section, and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Otherwise, if you have to head out, you can always look me up uh, at SimonEyes23 on most social platforms, um, or check out my website at simonhabib.com. All the links are there. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate you going through everything, man. Uh, to everybody out, yeah, to everybody out there, as Simon mentioned, please uh, feel free to use the question prompt and we're gonna spend this time to go through Q&A and we have a ton. So uh, let's just jump right in first of all. Um, Simon, the first question here for you is from Dullery Jeremy, who says, for the markers, did you have a specific mask per actor to keep it consistent and per session or was this for face for processing? How did you determine that? Um, I've seen some studios actually 3D print masks that fit the shape of, of their performers and they'll actually like drill in different little holes, uh, the right number of holes to match the landmarks in Analyzer. But uh, on our end, we try to keep it consistent by having just a single user apply the dots every time. So I think anybody who's worked in Analyzer long enough kind of knows exactly where those landmarks should land on an actual human face. Um, and so I think it just came out of habit. We didn't we didn't use mask on our project. So it was just kind of one piece of advice is always work from outside in. So you start with your corners, you find your middle, and then you kind of uh, go that way. So no, no masks used for ours. Cool. Uh, next question here is from Marcin Pasco, who says, what's the total number of head blend shapes that were produced after the 
photogrammetric uh, scanning. And is the final rigged head combined skinned head or were these blend shapes? Um, so our LOD zero was a blend shape rig in runtime. So for all of our cinematics, we had actual blend shapes running an engine. It's a proprietary in-house engine. So, you know, we blend shapes were optimized and we were able to have uh, each character's facial rig had 138 blend shapes. Um, and that came from about 25 uh, expressions in our photogrammetry scanning session. So we would ask the actors to do the, the models to do specific expressions. And then those were broken up into 138. Uh, to answer the question about skinning and joints, we did have a blend shape decomposition system that would allow us to have bone-driven faces uh, for the other LODs. So when you know we're further away, um, even even background characters during cinematics could fall back to a, a different LOD that was uh, skinned. Good to see. Her. Uh, next one is from Jessica Daly, who says, "Is it fair to say that with an actor bound to a certain character, that trying to use a different actor with the same character would not work as well with the data?" I would I would argue uh, that that the actor doesn't have to resemble their character. I, I think that's the beauty of of facial animation and having any range of actors, you know, even um, age, ethnicity, it doesn't really matter because. It, it really comes down to the performance. And I think the what makes the what sells the performance is the animator's touch. Because it all comes down to the binding. Like we were talking about when we build the profiles, that, that initial step is where it really, really matters. There is a lot of in artistic interpretation. The further you move away between your actor and your character, there's a lot of interpretation, but that's where the uh, um, animator's touch comes in. So if if you're successfully binding certain expressions, then you're, the two of them can be widely different and still get great performances. I think that's that's how I would pitch that. Um, I mean, just just to dig back into a bit of my my own portfolio, uh, one of the craziest projects I got to work on was the Ninja Turtles, and mm. the, the performers looked nothing like their character counterparts. But it was one of the wildest thing because, as long as you bind your expressions properly, you got the Ninja Turtles moving properly. On our game, I would say uh, Rocket was the one that that raise the most eyebrows. A lot of people had doubts that we were able, we would be able to translate uh, Alex's performance onto the Rocket character. But uh, after seeing a couple of tests, people were saying that he's the one that he seems to emote the most. <laughs> so, yeah. Very cool. Uh, how about the, uh, the the process here? This is another question from Dollar Jeremy, who says, how long was the entire process in months? It's hard to put a, a specific number on that because we all kind of jump on the project at different times. And uh, the, the R&D kind of tends to bleed into production. So pre-production um, and, and production, there's, there's a bit of a crossover there, especially when we're talking about like vertical slices where we're building cinematics and, you know, as prototypes and those actually end up shipping in the game. So if I measure my own time, I've been at the company for four years and, but uh, we wrapped up the project early last year. So I would say, personally, I was on the project for about three years. Gotcha. Uh, I see a question here related to the, the face wear aspect that I wanted to bring up. Um, it was specifically, um, what were the goals you guys set out when choosing face wear? And did you evaluate any other solutions that helped you uh, determine this is the way forward for the game? Yeah, uh, without naming names, uh, I won't necessarily go into which software we evaluated. Uh, but there was another another software that was used in-house before I came in. So I really wanted to do uh, my due diligence and really study this software as best as I could. I gave myself, I think, two and a half months to really get to learn the software and, and learn its strengths. And then we did the sort of, you know, Pepsi, Coca-Cola test where we ran the same footage, same character, same poses, even like lined them up on the same frames between two software because I really wanted to prove that is the end result that matters. We have to consider the process and the in the workflow and um, everything that's automatic automation. Those are all factors to be considered. But what we really cared about was the final animation output. And so when we put the two side by side, it really came down to it was, you know, that comes down to preference. But ultimately, it it, it edged to faceware, and uh, and and we're happy that we got to work with it. The other factor is to consider is that. Um, a lot of softwares, uh, software providers don't provide har uh, hardware, so the helmet cams, the the recording, the whole the whole setup. So it's kind of a bit of a turnkey solution when when we worked with uh, Faceware. Cool man. Uh, was there any, for my knowledge, was there any um, rig changes you guys had to make once you made that decision? 
No, actually, that's that's int an interesting question because um, I mean, Facebook can bind itself to pretty much any rig. It's it's as it's just anything that's an animatable parameter in your three D software. So uh, whatever was driving the previous rig ended up just you know working with this with with Facebook after we made the switch. Cool. Uh, okay, here is another question from, um, well, actually, this is the first time we're hearing from Noah Lee. He said, can you elaborate a bit on the uh, profile setup process? Were there training frames picked by the motion artist team, or was that auto-selected by Analyzer? Uh, we, we would solve, we would track, um, sorry, let me go back. When we're working with our facial ROM as the basis for our tracking model, it was always entirely manual. Like that, that training part for us was crucial to set up um, the, the closest, when, when we're talking about binding, it's like every time the actor does this expression, we want our character rig to do that expression. And that that for us is the most important part because it's the basis for all of our batching. So that part was manual and that was entirely owned by the motion artist team. So the fact that we were recording our ROMs um, with the same sheet, you know, the same order of expressions, the more you work on it, the more you start recognizing the the order of expressions. And which ones are problematic, especially when they blend in one to the other. So once we've done it enough time, and the fact that it was held within just the four of us, and we were together throughout the entire project, like we, I think it would have been more challenging if we had newcomers and things like that. So having the four of us kind of like building all these profiles, we started getting really, really quick at it. But it was always manual. We we wouldn't leave it up to chance with like a, an auto track or an auto solve. It, that might work for maybe secondary characters, but for for our main cast, it was always uh, a manual process. Gotcha. Uh, this kind of goes to that area too, which is um, delineating between the different quality levels. A uh, question from Tiago Flores, who says, how did you guys make the decision between bronze, silver, and gold? Uh, and did you discuss with the producer on the team and make, making a team decision based on every any other factors, or was this approved budget? Maybe you could talk about that. For sure. Um, I think I think another way of thinking of the quality tiers is also the, the uh, amount of labor required uh, in each tier, so there's there's a, a almost like a monetary um, qualifier to these to these levels, right? Um, mm. um, I just noticed that the, the video here wasn't playing, so let me let me <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> yes, so the the quality levels that we so bronze for us was always automated. This should require like basically no manual labor for bronze. Um, so that that includes anything that's running in game, uh, including our conversations. There's a couple of conversations that we felt deserved a bit more attention. So we that's what we would consider like upgrading to silver, where now, okay, there's somebody going in and doing a technical polish, polish pass, um, making sure the lips contact were needed, the teeth, and you know, because maybe something that was planned to be in a gameplay camera is now locked camera for an actual like cinematic conversation. So some sequences would actually get upgraded like that. Um, we we determined that anything that was locked camera is by default a silver. Like that was just that's kind of how we drew the line between bronze and silver. The the line between silver and gold is a bit more blurry because while the motion artist team works in Maya uh, on those standalone scenes, we're doing like a technical and an artistic polish pass within Maya, but we're not in the context of the scene. So generally, once it is passed on to an animator and then there's keyframe polish in the scene, we would consider that a gold. So that's kind of how we differentiated the, the different quality levels. Um, where I would like to see in the future is that the motion artist team actually gets to go into the, the scene with the body, with the cameras, and actually get a chance to do the gold pass as well. So, um, but like I said, 90% of all of our game, all of our cinematics were, were, were silver. So nobody, I don't think I could have ever predicted that at the beginning of the project. I actually thought it would be closer to like a 50-50 but we actually ended up owning a, a big chunk of that. So that was cool. Was that because of time savings? Like you guys started yeah. low with the estimate? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. I think the quantity and the length of our cinematics ended up being much more than we had expected. And I think we had saved, you know, a few months at the end to do that, that gold polish. But ultimately, you know, it's only the people that are working in it that can really tell the difference between, a, you know, a, a silver and a gold. The golds yeah. really stand out, like the one I just showed, that. I don't think you would mistake that as just being a technical pass. That's like, there's artistry in that. Totally. Um, and, and, and I don't think we could have done all of our cinematics at that level, given the amount of time that it takes. Yeah. Um, but for example, the sequence that's looping here, uh, the, the cameras are way up close in the faces. And this was one of the motion artists who, who did the, uh, the, the facial animation on this sequence. Mm -hmm. So, yeah.
Yeah, it looks I hope so. That your question. Sorry, I think ahead. that was really good. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna go to this one from Jacob Kuehl, who says, uh, first of all, he said, thanks for doing the talk. And next he says, uh, on average, how many poses did you have for one character's shared pose library? That's an interesting question. Uh, I'm trying to think the number off the top of my head. Sometimes I, I'm baffled where it's like, I would go check how many the browse have in the shared pose library, and I said 10 for the entire project. Like, <laughs> I, would, I would be shocked by how few the eyebrows require, and Facer actually does a really good job with very few. I think it kind of goes, you know, let's say, I, this is complete ballpark numbers, don't quote me on this, but it's something like maybe 10 to 30 for the brows, maybe 50 for the eyes, and I'd say maybe 150, 200 for the mouth, you know, because we have different phonemes combined with different, different expressions. Uh, for example, if you're smiling, but you're sneering, or I don't know, just there's so many more combinations to do with the, the mouth. Don't forget that the mouth is basically under the eyes, so it includes cheeks, nose, sneers, all of that is, is happening in the lower part. So yeah, the mouth is definitely the part that takes the longest. Yeah, I got you. Um, here's one that's uh, kind of about the uh, on-set experience. Maybe you can talk a little bit about it. They say, what's the biggest challenge working with multiple actors, multiple mocap actors? I think it's the uh, the time restriction, I'd say, is probably the biggest challenge because they come in and you've got the producer basically staring at a clock for about an hour <laughs> while we're suiting everyone up. Uh, so that could be a bit nerve wracking, but once everybody is suited up and we're we're recording, I'm I'm completely sold on the whole performance capture process. The idea of having every you know that that all the performances are are cohesive, like you're shooting the voice, the body, and the face all at the same time. Um, and then in the future, if we can get hands in there, it's just that to me it becomes a no-brainer. Um, obviously, there's the, the the restriction of finding the right cast that can do all of those things. That's you might find the perfect voice actor, but they're physically not quite like the character. Uh, so that's that's a, a bit of a challenge as well to try to cast people that can do full performance. Yeah, um, that's the ideal, right? And it's yeah. cool you guys are able to do that with so many shots of everybody together. It's like it's, it's yeah. beautiful, really. And uh, but in terms of challenge, I'm trying to think. Oh, um, I mean, more of a technique. This is like down to the nitty gritty, but. Uh, just Wi-Fi interference. You would never think about it, but sometimes in a busy downtown building, uh, a lot of cell phones going off. You, you know, just Wi-Fi networks in a building, it can it can actually hinder the the transmission of video data. So our v video feeds occasionally would get staticky, would just simply just disconnect mid takes. So I think that's like really down to the, like the most aggravating things because if you're in the heart of the moment in a sequence, usually we don't call cut. We'll just we know that that's a scrap take. We'll let the performers finish finish their acting, and then we'll take it again. But having to scramble to try to change the Wi-Fi band <laughs> is like not it's 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 not sexy, but it's um it's kind of like the reality of working on set. Gotcha. Uh, here's one from Chad Gleason who says, "Can you divulge how many animators or mocap artists and cinematics um, participated on the project?" Uh, that number has changed quite a bit. I can tell you for the motion artist team, it's four. Just we were always four. It was the four from the beginning all the way to the end. That's why that's why I felt comfortable putting that picture because it's always been us like setting up the face rep, face rep profiles. Uh, in terms of cinematics, we the team definitely grew in size when needed. Uh, we had um, third party vendors as well helping us out uh, for for a bit of the scene assembly, especially because that's very time consuming. And then for the animation polish as well. Uh, and then we had a lot of creatures. We had scenes that required yeah, several creatures at a time. So yeah, our, I, I want to say, I, I think I, I, it's best not to say. I think sure. in-house we had something about like 20, but I can't, I can't know exactly how many people joined, the, joined that team at any moment. Yeah, it's good to see the, the picture of the four of you though. You know, it's a good indication that these are the four that were there from the beginning of the end. I love you guys all with your, your power poses there, <laughs> showing you <laughs> ownership over everything. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Aaron Lowe. He said, what was the uh, experience from turnaround time from the shoot date to the final delivery date? I think, I think that was one of the more mind blowing things on this production. Uh, I couldn't have predicted it. I think the cinematic director, producers, I don't think anybody could have really predicted how quick of a turnaround that was. Uh, from the moment like we're set, setting foot on set to the moment that we have an actual blocked scene, we're talking about about 48 hours. Like it was, um, and the beauty of it is that while I might have been booked for an entire week of, of recording sessions, 
we would hand off this data, you know, it would, especially the, the, the video data would be assembled uh, overnight. So we had like this process that would assemble everything, create those uh, sort of tiled videos, all that was being generated overnight. And in the morning, the remaining three other motion artists would basically start solving the body data, maybe run to the, the bronze as well. And so the animators basically had working animations, you know, within within about a day or two. Uh, and this is, the, the bronze was not all also just for placeholder, but it was to unblock every department after us. So they, we never felt like a bottleneck. And then as we had sort of first pass bronze scenes uh, popping up into the game, that gave us more time to do the polish afterwards. So between every recording sessions, if we had like a month between recording sessions, that was the month that we were polishing whatever we had just shot and then pass on to the next one. And so this is just fantastic planning and great, great job on, on our producers uh, to, to be able to line up all of our shoots like that. Yeah, that's an incredible time. I mean, you guys should feel proud of that. Um, <laughs> a lot of teams aspire to that turnaround time. So I'm anxious to dig in with you with that uh, later on <laughs> myself. Yeah. And uh, I did okay. mention in the in the presentation, the, the comparison, I, I know that not everybody has access to a mocap stage like we had, but that, you know, the benefit of having a stage where you can shoot your actors in house with, and when you own the, the recording process and the, the, the data processing, all of that, I mean, it's, it's hard to compare having to, to deal with a third party vendor. Granted, like if we always, always had like a backup solution, if the quantity, the amount of data was getting too much, we always had uh, other mocap studios that we probably could have recorded at, but we never needed to fall back on that. Yeah, definitely a luxury for sure. Uh, here's a question from Stanislav Dudko who says, I hate, I may have missed this point. Uh, why weren't there markers used during the recording of the facial animation? In some shots, there are no markers on the actor's faces. This was actually a theory that I tested. I think I might've reached out to you, Max, and a couple of people at Faceware. This theory that if you build your profile with the dots, can you solve footage that has no dots? Which means that we no longer have to rely on the dots. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, because the morphology of the performer's face remains the same. As long as the framing and the focus is generally the same, the dots no longer are no longer required. The, 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 the footage that you saw that didn't have dots was likely meant to use as bronze, meaning that we weren't going to manually go in and track it anyways. And those dots are really beneficial for the user. When we're working in the analyzer to know exactly where to place a dot consistent from expression to expression, like I was mentioning, consistency is super important. Uh, the dots remove all guesswork and all that human error where it's like on one frame, it's in the middle of the brow, then another it's here, and then another it's here. Like it, Analyzer has a hard time making sense of where, if, if you're inconsistent with where you place your dot, you're going to get a lot of shakes in your data. Um, so the dots are especially useful for anything that we're shooting in silver because we're likely going to manually um, adjust the tracking. And so we remove that guesswork. Uh, but everything that we were shooting for banters uh, didn't require dots. Then there's the other factor is that during COVID and, and, and social distancing, we couldn't really get too close in the bubble, in the actors' bubbles, you know, um, and asking them to, to remove their masks so that I could dot it. We basically said, we, we don't need that. So I think that's the long answer for that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good to hear. Um... We'll move on to this one from uh, Tristan Morell, who says, how much time did you guys give for an animator for a gold pass? For a gold pass, that's interesting. Um, I guess it, it always comes down to the complexity of the shot. I want to say it, it's, you know, several days. We could talk about maybe, uh, again, I can't convert seconds to days. Totally. Because um, it really depends on how close the shot is, how emotional. Uh, if somebody is just doing straight up talking and we still upgrade it, but like, actually, now that I think of it, if it's just straight up talking, it's usually not a gold. It'll be probably a silver. Like the, the scenes that I'm thinking of are the ones like the most heart-wrenching scenes. Let's just leave it at that. The, the most emotional scenes, those ones, we, we probably gave it a couple of weeks. You know, mm -hmm. like have an animator go in and just down to the finite detail. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think that's the, the flexibility of the production to be able to just determine which shots needed the most. I think it would be overkill to try to do every shot as a gold. Uh, because it's it's not always necessary. It really just has to to have that emotional punch where where it's me most meaningful. Yeah, and like you said, you started with silver and then kind of built your way up to as it was required. Yep, exactly. We we never. I don't think we ever determined right from the bat or like from from planning or from even recording, saying like this will have to be a goal unless 
I mean, in the script, you can kind of tell this is going to be a gold, but it's, it's as you said, we would look at how does the silver look in, in lens? How does it look in the camera? Does it service the scene? And if it doesn't, if it needs that extra push, then we'll upgrade after. I think it's kind of a case by case. Gotcha. Uh, we'll move on to this one. This is a good question coming in from uh, Matt Mirsky, who says, uh, do you have any advice uh, or what advice would you give to a new steady studio setting up a face pipeline? Advice. Hmm. Give yourself time. <laughs> it's going to take some time to like build a pipeline from scratch. Um, that's actually the beauty that that I had on this project. I I mean, I, I have to give kudos to IDOS because when I joined the team, it was, I want to say it was nothing but green lights. I did my research. I showed that I was thorough in my process and everything. But when it came down to making decisions and, yeah. and you know, even when we were determining how many headcams did we need for the set, I thought asking for six was going to be overkill. And they're just like, yep, go ahead. You know, that's that's. So you have to have the backing from the studio. You have to understand the benefit that you get from full performance, or at the very least, just facial performance capture. Um, and so, as much as, as as much as you care about facial animation, if the studio doesn't have your back on that, you're going to be struggling. The other part is it was a bit of a gamble, but when I said if there's a microphone, there's a head cam, that was basically something I said early on the project. I thought they'd all laugh me out of the room, but no. They said, cool, we're, we're doing that. So I think it, it has to be part of a conversation. I just, I always expected to have to make a case or defend it or something like that. But it was, I was fortunate enough that they understood that if we want quality, if we want believable performances, this was the way to go. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Andre Leclerc who says, hi, I'm curious on how you match the capture of the actor and the 3D model of Rocket. <laughs> I think that's that's probably the one that required the most artistry, honestly. So that's I think I, I touched upon that in one of the questions of like, how can you have a performer that doesn't look like their character? This is like the most extreme case where you take something. I mean, you could have a character that has no eyes and is just a big giant mouth and still make it work, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In the case of Rocket, it's really you look at what the actor is doing, even if there's asymmetry, even if there's some wild expressions going on in the performer's face. You do your best to find the corresponding controllers to get that expression. It might not be, I mean, it won't be one-to-one. -one. It's not just that it might not be, it's it's a raccoon, right? Um, so it's it's about finding the corresponding value. And then every time uh, the actor's name was Alex, every time Alex does uh, expression X, you expect Rocket to do whatever expression you fed him. And that's the rinse and repeat. So you do that for everything that Alex is doing, you find the corresponding expression on Rocket. And then the software does the interpolation after that. Yeah, cool. Uh, here's one more from Chad Gleason that says, can you describe your process from shot to scene assembly in the 24 hours? Um, on, on the motion artist team, it was it was kind of uh, clean up the, the mocap data, do a bronze pass, and we export all of these in FBX. Of course, the, the, the files that we export is the entire take. So if the take we recorded for five minutes, but we're only using a minute of it, we would still solve the entire five minutes. And so because it's automated, a big part of that for the body and for the face, it didn't really cost us much more. It's just you know processing time on the, on the computer. But if we provide the animators this five minute take, they basically bring that into Motion Builder and then uh, stitch whatever they need from multiple takes. And I think I think once, let's just say we did I don't know, five takes of a specific uh, shot, but we're only using take two and take four, then they would have the full take of only two and four and then stitch whatever parts they need. We didn't have to solve the others. So we would at least have a selection process done relatively quickly. Um, and that's how we we're basically able to provide the animators with, with the, the bronze files. And they wouldn't come back to us. You know, We would never really hear from them because they have everything they need. And then when our silver was done, um, because everything is referenced, right? So you just overwrite, and boom! All of a sudden, the silver just appears in their scene. So that's that's the beauty of having bronze. That's awesome. I uh, got a question here about the the actors and the helmets, uh, which said, how did the actors, all of them, uh, throughout the course of the shoot, like having them having wearing the helmets the whole time? Was there any discomfort? Uh, we have. We had a, a few actors that are used to working in Montreal at different studios without dropping any names. 
Uh, and the, whatever helmets they use over there, uh, they they would always cheer when they had to wear ours. I don't know. They they always said how comfortable it was, how lightweight they tend. I mean, it sounds like I'm I'm making an ad here, but it's uh, <laughs> they they genuinely said that it was very comfortable. Um, in a uh -huh. few cases where it was just a question of counterweight, we could just attach a, a small weight on the back of the helmet. That's really down to preference. But um, the, the fact that we have different sizes of helmets, different padding. Um, it, the actors have often said that it felt seamless. It never really hindered their performances. Perfect. That's uh, that's exactly what we're going for, is trying to make it as inobtrusive as possible so that actors can stay in character, you know? Yeah, yeah. Here's a question from Jose Luis Mandina Gonzalez, who says, if the actor or actress touches his or her face, is the face capture not usable, or do you usually find a workaround? And then second part was, do you, the fake, face for technicians always try to avoid scenes where the actors have to touch their face, like dragging a hand across their face or doing a, the home alone expression or something like that? Well, this is a kind of a happy, happy coincidence, I guess, where yeah. if the hand, because we're doing full performance capture, if the hand passes over the face, well, so does, so it does the same for the character. So on the frames where the hand is passing over the face and you don't see the face, well, even if those keys are not usable, you're not seeing the face. <laughs> so it it's just so happens. So if, if somebody's doing this, well, you don't really have to animate the mouth doing a proper lip sync because you're not actually seeing it. So if this is another example where if the if the they were shot separately, the motion actor, um, sorry, the mocap actor was doing something, and then the face actor that did it in a separate shoot touched his face. Well, then all of a sudden that doesn't work because the, the you're hiding the face where we were actually supposed to see it. But in for, for, for full performance where everything is synced together, it actually just works out that way. Yeah, good call. Um, here's a question about team size, full, full team size. How big was the production? I'm not gonna be able to get into numbers, unfortunately. Like it's, it's that's kind of like above my pay grade, I think. Uh, just again, you know how pr game production is. We ramp up, we scale. Right. Uh, we have a lot of outsourcing vendors and things like that. So the actual number, I'm, I'm not privy to that. Gotcha. Uh, what about uh, from Carlos Abrego, who says, if you had to do it all over again, you could change anything, what would you change? Oof. That's an interesting question. I don't think I've been asked that yet. What would I change? Um, Heavy. Honestly, I'm tempted to say nothing. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I, I'm going to look fondly on, on the last, on this production. It was, I... I'm really glad of everything that we built, the relationships that we built in the team, the pipelines. Um, I, I mean, even just the subject matter, the, the, the project was such a wild ride. Um, I'm thinking more like in, in terms of tech, uh, I did mention a bit at the end that I wish that we had a bit more time to polish uh, in the scenes, but to the average player that, that plays our game, they just walked away with just great performances and, uh, I mean, it's it's maybe tooting my own horn, but the the amount of awards that we won for narrative and best performances, nominations and awards, just goes. It's a testament to the writing. It's a testament to the performances, but it all comes down to what do you see on screen. So I'm I'm super proud of what what our team has accomplished, and uh, it's it's really hard to think of uh, things that we would want to change. It's kind of like no, nope, just leave it like that, and I think we're very happy. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that when there's not. Uh, you know, a whole list of regrets and you're like, you can walk away and say, we learned a lot and we're, you know, excited about the choices we made. That's, uh, that speaks a lot. Yeah. Uh, here's a question that says, um, did you work with any other body motion systems? Did you work with Xens? Was it all optical based? For this project, the mocap stage was one of the things that was already figured out. I think uh, we, we had shot other projects before before Guardians. So I think the mocap suits uh, were tried and true. And uh, we had a lot of, uh, basically our teams had were already used to this setup. So we didn't really explore any other uh, body mocap suits. Gotcha. How about the, um, oh wait, actually a new question just popped up. Let me go to this one next. This is, is there a reason to use a blend shape ring, rig versus a joint based rig for face, face wear? Or was this just a personal preference for your team? It really comes down to personal preference. Uh, I did I did mention that I, I have a background in rigging, did about 10 years in rigging, and this is like one of those eternal debates uh, between bones and blend shapes, because a lot of studios will have bones primarily and then blend shapes uh, as, as um, correctives, and then others will have full blend shapes and use bones as correctives. Like it's, it really, 
um, it, it, it comes down to your artist's preference because when it's a, a joint base rig, a lot of times the expressions are, are driven by the rigging team. Whereas when it's a blend shape rig, it's driven by the character artist team. So it really depends where do you want to put the weight on your, on your pipeline. Um, if your character artists say, no, I just want to do clothing and creatures and props and things like that, and I don't want to have to deal with facial blend shapes, then it's likely that your rigging team is going to have to deal with the, the, uh, the major work here with, uh, with making sure that the joints give believable expressions. So it's, um, I, I, don't, I don't really think there is necessarily a winner in that category in terms of quality. I think you could get incredible uh, expressions with, with joints as well. It's, it also depends on how, how much is your engine capable of running. Because I know blend chips can be very taxing on the engine. Uh, so, so that's why most games will go for a bone-driven uh, solution. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of factors to consider. But in terms of quality, I think both are capable. Okay, cool. Uh, here's a question from Tristan Morell who says, were you able to automate analyzer batching? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, it's not, not just were we able, it was necessary. I don't think a project like this would have even been possible um, if we were to track everything manually. With the amount of just in-game dialogue and, um, and, and all of our cinematics, like I was mentioning, the turnaround. If you wanted that turnaround of, from shooting to just blocking, uh, batching was uh, an absolute, absolute must. Yep. Uh, I think this one was already answered, but just in case you had anything else mm -hmm. to add, I asked, um, how often did you record ROMs for single talents? Uh, and how long were they normally? Um, yeah, I think I touched a bit on it during the presentation. I don't mind repeating, but it's the uh, we would we, it was just a habit for us to shoot a facial ROM at the beginning of every session, even if you know for the for our core team of guardians, those five. I don't I can't even keep track of how many facial ROMs we must have recorded with them. But it was it, it had other benefits, you know, like for um, for audio calibration and just warm up. If we started the day with that. A lot of times it's kind of like just stretching out their faces and um, there are other advantages which is why we shot it many times and it was also a good fallback for example if for some reason the framing was drastically different and then our, our tracking model no longer works with that day's shoot just for some fluke we figured five minutes of recording a rom versus trying to polish every animation that's generated out of that batch it's it's um, a bit of a, a no-brainer when you make the comparison so we always said if we had to fall back on on that day's ROM, we always could. Luckily, we never had to. Um, also worth mentioning for the same performer, uh, if somebody had a very big beard, uh, and sometimes beards are required by contract because they're shooting another television show or a movie, and then they come in with a big beard and their ROM was originally built without one, we tend to have uh, variations in those cases. So it's the same. Uh, same performer, you would just put like an underscored beard or something like that. And now you have, it's kind of treated as a different performer, but um, at least the shared pose library could still benefit because the morphology still remains the same. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. And I know I just want to give one more shout out to the, everybody watching. If you have more, please throw them in the chat. We're going to try to get through as many as we can. Uh, if we don't get through all of them, a couple, couple things to note. Uh, we're going to pass all the questions to Simon so that he'll have a full list. So if we don't get through it today with our time allotted, uh, you know, he, he will see it and be able to get back to you. And then second is we have a Discord. Uh, if you're not available or if you're not on it, if you haven't seen it before, Facebook's Discord, and Simon's on there. And sometimes, Simon, you're gracious enough to jump in and answer people's direct questions with your vast knowledge. So uh, if we don't have it today, maybe throw it in there and him or anybody else in our community can try to get back to you guys with some of these uh, really good questions too. But uh, I want to go to this next one, which is for the, specifically on the ROMs. For the facial ROMs, did you follow our expression list, or did you guys make a custom list? Uh, it's through many iterations that we ended up with the list that we used at the start of Guardians. Um, I think I think the goal is to re really, I mean, even even whoever's writing this list can can look in a mirror and just try whatever your face is capable of doing, and then try to break it down uh, systematically. I think that's the, it's not it's not facts based. I, I know some studios will do it try to try to do it facts based, but that's a lot more technical. I think this is mostly what are the more common expressions that you that our face tends to do. Even trying to isolate specific things like an eyebrow without moving your eye is practically impossible. But um, so I think it's it's really uh, yeah. I think there's no there's no set rule. There's no golden rule for what should be in your ROM. 
and how long you want your ROM to be. Like I was saying, ours is about five to six minute long. That might be way too long for some other studios. Um, and it's it's a lot of it is the uh, the test sentences that we do at the end with different uh, degrees of expressions and so yeah it really comes down to each each uh, studio and it, it's going to take some experimentation before you lock down that list yeah we always say our list is like a recommended guideline but i've had um, a lot of interesting conversations recently with some facts experts who have been redesigning roms based on mm -hmm. Uh, maybe going from muscular movements first rather than going through or expressions from the character versus expressions from the actors so it mm. always seems preference based around the team and, and the larger conversations needed up front on what the goals are uh, before we step in and say no do it this way or anything you know it's a good point yeah uh, here's a question from Brooklyn Douglas which says uh, in general what what are you most proud of for the face pipeline I guess the amount of animations that our, that our little team of four were able to own, I think that yeah. that was incredible. Um, when when I signed up for this project, even I, I have to, the disclaimer is that I'm not an animator. I always dreamt of being an animator when I was in, early in my career. I was more of a technical person dreaming of doing animation. So even joining this project, I thought I'm just the guy who's gonna build the pipeline. I'll be on set and, and that's it. But I actually got to do a lot of the animations in, in this game. And, some of the more emotional, uh, emotionally impactful scenes I got to work on. So I think that that's just me personally. And I think for the team, it's the just the quantity that we were able to deliver. Um, and I, I guess the, what else are, am I especially proud? I think the, the, the chemistry between just our team was just incredible. Uh, one story that I like to tell is the, when we're assigned shots, you know, when we're breaking down uh, after a, a performance capture shoot, we have our tasks assigned and we kind of know which sequences we're going to work on. If there's any sequence that we saw during the day of the shoot, we're like, I love that sequence. I would love to work on that. We would yeah. trade sequences almost like trading cards. Wow. Like, I'll give you this one if you give me that one. <laughs> um, so that, that was a lot of fun. That's, that's just the, I guess, the, um, the chemistry that you build in your team to be able to trust one another to do that. I, I always uh, love when seeing all the B-roll footage of you during the photogrammetry sessions, during the mocap sessions, doing the animation. Like, I'm not saying you were involved in the whole game, like, or you were the main, but you were certainly, I, I can feel from you how your involvement in these different areas gave you like insight on maybe the other people are experts in these areas, but I can see more, more things that I'm involved early on in the beginning to help build the pipeline later on, which is so important. I think I, I like what you say there. I, I laugh about that sometimes when I look at the behind the scenes footage and I'm just, I feel like I'm in every shot of like, so I, that's just how it worked out. But to the actual reality is, um, I, I, I wanna say that it comes down to trust, ownership and recognition. That's, yeah. that's not something you'll find in every studio, unfortunately. I really believe that what we had at IDOS is, is this, the, the trust in what I was selling in this this pipeline that I didn't even, I had never done something of this size and I could have fallen flat on my face and I'm so glad that the gamble paid off. Um, but so that the confidence of the studio and the the recognition that came afterwards, people all acknowledged that the work that we did in helped to, to, to deliver these these scenes. So um, I wish I wish for everybody listening to this to, to, to find that team, to find the people who who drive you, who push you to to do your best and and, and yeah, don't become roadblocks. <laughs> Uh, I got a couple more questions here. Actually, just a couple more minutes. So I'm going to, okay. as I ask for more questions, you guys in the audience are absolutely asking them. So thank you for that. Uh, Wonderful but, questions, by the way. I have to take a break to just say like, wow, dude, like I didn't expect this many and such such diverse questions as well. Totally. Uh, Kieran O'Sullivan says, did you create style guides for the characters like Rocket so the people doing retargeting or anyone in the future would know if the actor does this expression, then Rocket does that expression? That's a great question. I think in the shared poses, there's the ability of storing thumbnails. And I think at the beginning of the project, we had said we were going to try to set them up. And I think production got in the way, just deadlines and things like that, that we never really did. I know that Retargeter does offer that. If if somebody is in charge of building out the pose library, so the, the, the profile for a given character, they are basically establishing that style guide. I, I suppose you could have an entire team collaborating on this, but the more different people you have building a profile, the more you might get some inconsistency because everybody kind of works slightly different on the same rig. 
So we like to give people the, the opportunity to build a profile and that that becomes the baseline. So when we would build our bronze, the bronze is generated based on the expressions that that person provided. And then when you're doing your technical pass, you're kind of working with what's already there as a baseline on your timeline. If you start introducing too many different expressions or using controllers that basically are flat after you've already done your bronze, that means that that controller doesn't appear in the pose library. And introducing new controllers could give you some, some jitters and some inconsistency or pops in, you know, on your timeline. So trying to work within the, um, the rails, I guess, of the pose library would be a good, a good uh, way of staying consistent. But we didn't have you know, style guides like you're describing where you, you see an actor doing this, a um, character doing that. Like we didn't have it necessarily visually like that. Gotcha. Uh, this is an interesting question. I know you guys use the, um, the stage as often as possible. And we've had some teams I've worked with directly who had transitioned entirely to capture at home and sending equipment mm -hmm. to actors houses, which is a whole thing that uh, during the pandemic, a lot of teams had to pivot to. And I know you guys were super fortunate to try to use a space as much as possible or capture happened before, during. Um, but this one specifically, was there was there aspects of capture that you did transition where some people remote and how did you work through the communication aspect? Sorry, this is also from Tommy Boswell. Yeah, I've, I'm actually fascinated with how adaptable the gaming industry was during this period. We saw so many studios figuring out how to send the equipment. and um, But on our end, I think the break, when everything went, you know, got locked down, I think the break was about only two to three months before we were actually able to pick up again. We had to prove to the um, acting union that we have here in Canada that we were following strict guidelines. Uh, they came and did an evaluation of our mocap stage and the facilities, you know, from entrances, doorways, meeting rooms, everything was like sort of up to standard and we were back shooting within I think three months after the lockdown, uh, during, you know, still technically under lockdown, um, we're able to, to shoot, but we have to, we had to prove that we were still very, um, how do you say, uh, judicious, I guess, with, uh, with, uh, all the protocol and like that we were respecting everything. So we, we didn't have to adopt, uh, adopt any sort of, um, shoot from home. Granted the, the whole company was working from home, uh, at our desks, but specific to the shoots, we were always able to uh, to shoot in in our studio. Actually, one one difference worth mentioning is that originally we were supposed to shoot our our voice acting, like the the banter's and everything, still with the head cams, but in a typical audio booth behind the glass with an audio director. Uh, but because that's basically the size of a closet, uh, even even having four people kind of shoulder to shoulder um, wouldn't have worked under COVID uh, restrictions. So. The mocap stage actually ended up being perfect because they were in the four corners of the room, all spaced out, being able to still play off of each other's chemistry. So yeah. that that was really fantastic, and it's the same audio quality as what we shot in the cinematics. So, um, yeah, we adapted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you guys have people that were like connected, like producers, or anybody over Zoom that were able to watch the feed? Yeah, absolutely. So we had we had installed the camera sort of from the ceiling, so it had like an aerial view on the mocap stage. So even during uh, uh, PCAP shoots and uh, banters and things like that, we had people tuned in uh, from home. Nice. Uh, here's a question from Pete Bush on our side who said, how long, he was, I think he was just personally interested, how long did it take you and your team to learn Analyzer or Targeter? Pete's a big fan of ours. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it took us, um, I, actually, that's, that's actually the fascinating part. The, the, adaptability from other platforms. I think the theory and the uh, the philosophy behind how the software works is kind of translatable, honestly. So the from the moment that the in the motion artist team, when they were assigned the, the training for Facewear until they were assigned their first shots, I, I want to say it's like a matter of like a week, two weeks. Wow. Like they were very adaptable, but don't, don't forget that these are people that have a lot of experience uh, in the industry in general. So they have animation background. They're not as, um, maybe technical, they don't come from a rigging background or, or scripting, but in terms of animation, they, they're they like the true meaning of technical animators. They animate technically, you know, with, with tech in mind. Um, and that's why they, they were very quick to adapt. But honestly, I think, um, I think it's, it's a software that's relatively, it might be daunting at first, but it's relatively easy to pick up. Um, I don't know if this is an opportunity also to mention that there's a course coming up pretty soon. I don't have an exact date, uh, but there is a face for a course that I helped to build uh, that's coming up in 
matter of a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. I don't know. So it, it's coming up. And for anybody who wants to learn how to get started with Analyzer and Retargeter, uh, it, it, it should have all the info you need. Yeah, what, is it, uh, what does it cover specifically? Uh, how, to, how to shoot uh, a performance, how to oh. track it, how to retarget it. It's, and I, I even go into uh, batch processing as well, even in the course. So, and that's uh, it's analyzer and retargeter, and it's uh, do you know is the platform online? Yes, so it'll be free. It's part of the uh, UOL, so the Unreal Unlo uh, Online Learning Platform. Very cool. Yeah, as soon as we uh, have more information, I'd absolutely put that out, and I know you will too to do your best to get everybody informed. If you're on Discord, absolutely. we'll we'll put the links there too whenever it's available for everybody. Yeah, for now it's just a tease. It's not. It's not uh, officially. There's been there's been buzz about it, but it's not. Uh, there's no banners or anything just yet. Cool. Uh, I see two more questions here. I want to try to get through if we have time here. First one's from Juan Robles, who says, "How much time did it take to develop the pipeline itself?" Uh, I think I want to. I want to say about two to three months, something around there, before we were up and running. Granted, we, we could still work manually. We were still able to do the, the tracking. It's, I'm talking about mostly the automation tools, things that would, uh, you know, for example, um, just set up a new scene, do the play blasts, all those kind of like, um, what do you call that? Quality of life type of tools. So those were in development for about two to three months. And then we had the, the full batch uh, up and running after that. But that didn't really stop us from, from doing the manual process while we had all our, our licenses. Pretty cool. And this one is from, oh, I just lost it on my side. One second. Here it is. From Tristan Morrell, who said, did you guys use any real-time previs? Um, that's a good question. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Not, not for facial, at least. Uh, hmm. we, the thought came up many times if we wanted some uh, facial previs during the shoot. But I think when we had such quick turnaround with the batch process that it never, it was never really necessary. I think if we had runtime, we could have baked it with the body and submit that. But I think that the quality of the animations that we're getting from um, a pose library that was manually assembled, I think that's the biggest difference between uh, real time and post processed, is that like we can customize every individual expressions, um, and and the batch process basically, like I was saying, was running overnight, and then you could have animations almost the next day. So with a turnaround like that, we didn't necessarily need real time. Gotcha. Uh, small question for you real quick is, how big was the actual performance capture stage? I don't have the measurements. That's interesting. I didn't prepare that. <laughs> I want to say, uh, even in terms of how many steps does it take to get from one corner to another, I mean, a good example is our Groot. Uh, our actor is actually quite tall. And so when he's doing these sort of like even larger than life gestures, and he had to do a stride or a run, he would run from one corner to another and take about three steps. <laughs> so. So it's like I said, it's relatively small. It's not great for for large action sequences. Um, but if you've played our game, you've seen some action sequences that we did shoot in this tiny volume, and you would never know that it was super small. The yeah. magic of animation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in space where the space is literally limitless, and, and <laughs> world production much, much different. I think that's the irony. But they were saying that in a, in a game where, like you're saying, space is so vast. Um, this tiny mocap volume actually helped our performers feel a lot more intimate. They're saying that they had experience working in these sort of big warehouse mocap stages where everything feels distant and, and just sort of echoey. And here just felt homey, you know, felt very, wow. you know, everybody felt a lot closer to each other. And I was like, wow, I never thought of it that way. So the performers actually felt uh, emotionally closer, but also physically closer, you know? Yeah. And plus, like the tech crew was probably closer in proximity as well, as opposed to in a whole other room talking right, by behind a glass glass wall. You know, yeah. Uh, for us, for us, yeah, we always felt present in the room. Gotcha. Uh, I want to I want to say this one last question, and then but before I do, let me just give a quick shout out and a reminder to everybody about this whole video or this whole this whole webinar and our series here. First off. This is being recorded. I'm seeing a ton of questions about, is this going to be recorded? Are we going to have it later? And yes, uh, this will be recorded and presented back to everybody. We'll follow up and maybe send it out in a link to everybody so they have it, even people that weren't able to uh, join. So if you have anybody on your team that couldn't make it, uh, we'll make sure to get a link over so you can watch it. Um, of course, all the questions are going to Simon. I do want to give a shout out for next week. We're also doing a webinar. Facebook is hosting another webinar about joint 
uh, real-time production using facial and body with the XNs team. We're going to do a big webinar with them next Thursday. It's going to be 11 a.m. Pacific uh, time, and it's going to be pretty exciting. So if you're free next week, or hoping to see you there. It's going to be our second episode of MoCap with the MoCats. Um, so just as a quick reminder, and this last question I want to throw to you, uh, Simon, here comes from Vitaly. Man, I'm sorry, Vitaly, I'm going to butcher your last name here. It's a uh, Biel... I'm just going to say Vitaly B. I'm sorry. I don't even want to. I don't even want to ruin it. And he, he asks, uh, "How did you choose which takes to process uh, by the video only?" Uh, the cinematic director. That was on him. It was his job to basically splice everything together. Look at the. You know, he's present on the stage on the day, so he can actually call out uh, gut feeling, saying, "I think it's number two and number four. And so we would mark them down. And then um, later, after we assemble uh, assembled those tiled videos, where you get to see the performance from multiple angles, and he would actually also pay attention to the faces to just see like how is this going to translate onto the characters afterwards. So they would look at those uh, and and make his selection that way. Awesome. Um, uh, first of all, let me say thank you, Simon. Thank you for going through all this and being so open and spending all this time with us. It's super cool, man. It was a blast. Thanks for having me. And, and thank you for everyone for the questions, everybody who attended, and everybody who's going to watch the VOD. Uh, I think it's it's really fascinating to uh, to be able to connect with so many people, even though I'm at home. <laughs> yeah, me too, right? Uh, it does uh, it does feel really good to have so many people that stuck around the entire course of this. We've had over hundred, a couple hundred people that have stuck around from the beginning just to ask questions and participate. So there's That's a wonderful. lot of it, and. Um, Thank you again, everybody that joined. Uh, I'll leave it to follow up with you, Simon, and getting all these questions over to you. And for everybody else, join Discord or reach out to Simon directly, and we'll uh, see you on the next one. Thanks so much. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Simon. Take care, guys. Bye.